everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Here today, I am joined by the amazing Jennifer Blasey, coming to us from your part-time controller just outside of Philadelphia, talking to us about nonprofit broad risks, but not just any risk. What are we going to drill down into today, Jennifer? We're going to talk a lot about um, risks that relate to online or digital giving. I know we talk a lot about fundraising here, and mm -hmm. so I'm going to kind of give the accountant's perspective about some of the risks that are um, you know, created by our use of additional fundraising platforms and um, apps and things of that nature. Wow. You know, just when we think we're like getting in the stream of things, doing it right, getting ourselves more digitally facing for donors, and then we have to think about this. So I'm like really glad we're having this conversation, Jennifer, because as we move into this holiday season right around the corner, this is going to be for a lot of nonprofits a huge component. Um, and for some nonprofits, kind of like the first season that they've really leaned into this, um, you know, these platforms and the whole concept of digital giving. So, hey, I want to make sure that we, we give a shout out to all of our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday episode, super fun, all about fundraising. Um, and then 180 Management Group. So these are the folks that join us day in and day out. Also, we have this amazing cohort of co-hosts, say that fast three times, Jennifer, uh, and they come to us from all over the country. They're incredibly diverse in terms of the areas that they serve and the parts of the sector they work with. Amazing people. And so I hope you've been able to get to meet them and, and learn from them just like I have been. Okay, Jennifer, my friend, you are in the hot seat. Um, you have an interesting background because you have served in the nonprofit sector, right? I have. I've been a controller and a CFO at a, a couple different nonprofits. So I've been in the hot seat. I, I've experienced some of the pains that nonprofits can experience, but I'm now on the consulting side. So at your part-time controller, I consult with and work with a lot of nonprofits on best practices and tips and how to do their financials better and internal yeah. controls, all that great stuff. And originally, you know, I'm an auditor at heart and I was also a forensic accountant for many years. So I've, awesome. I, I have a wide uh, perspective on these topics. So being a forensic uh, um, auditor and, and understanding this gives you the, um, the um, ability and the amazing viewpoint of talking about this today. So I really appreciate this because I feel, and I don't know what you think, but before we get into it, I feel like some of this is somewhat new because we're just trying to become more digitally uh, focused with our our donors, right? And so for some organizations, they're just kind of getting on the train with donate now buttons and and all of these different tools that before it was kind of just like, you know, snail mail checks, right? Absolutely. And we we want to encourage that. And I think you know, there's often a collaboration needed between fundraising professionals, development professionals, mm -hmm. and then the accountants. We're often like putting on the brakes. Hang on. We don't want to prevent <laughs> bringing in the money, right? We just want to tap the brakes a little bit yeah. to, you know, make sure that we're being thoughtful about how we're accepting money, how we're accepting payments, mm -hmm. and, and making sure everyone's aware of the risks that can be created by offering all these great, you know, options of donating money, right? Mm -hmm. We all nonprofits need cash. They need money. They want no strings attached. And we want to make it as easy as possible for them to give it. Right. So that's mm -hmm. why donating on your website and now all of these great new cash apps that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, some donors have their preferences. Right. They want to give to you. I use yes. this, this app. Right. And yes. I by no means endorse any apps or critique any of the apps. But we just have to have the conversation internally at organizations about what are we using, what's appropriate, and what are the controls around it to make sure that we have mm -hmm. appropriate use and that our donors are also safeguarded. So let's start with that because the cash app phenomena, I mean, oh my gosh, it's there. It's just everywhere. And I know with my local bank, 
um, even they are, you know, pushing out information to their clients and trying to get their clients, you know, more in line with this. I mean, you're seeing this at valet stations to, you know, hairdressers and nail techs. It seems like everything, even children's tutors, like, you know, at school, um, things of that nature lining up. Talk to us about this and what you see in this Cash App ecosystem. So there's certainly so many available, right? But as yeah. a nonprofit, to receive, you know, donations that are eligible for a tax deduction, you know, you want to make sure your organization has an organization um, account with these apps, right? So if you're out at an offsite event, a fundraising event, and you're accepting donations through a cash app, it should be your organization's cap cash app, right? If somebody mm -hmm. gives money to a personal app and that employee then turns it over, you may have invalidated your tax deduction. So you have to be careful with things like that. So you want to make sure you're using an organization cash app. That's important. Not all of them offer that. Some nonprofits get a discount. Some don't. You know, have to be careful with what right. you're using. Right. Um, and also be aware of what you're using and what you want to use. I mean, I've come across organizations where you know, we may be doing something as simple looking at a, a, their bank statement and see, wait a second, I didn't know you were using this cash app. When did you start using that? Yeah. Oh, we had a summer camp. We decided we'd use this because we had the reader or we could easily download this. Right. Mm -hmm. So it kind of snowball with how do you you know, you could quickly lose control over what's out there and where is your money? It's such an interesting thing. And I I like that you aligned this to where you are, because if you are doing like a walk or you're at an off site, um, you know, even going and doing, a, as we call it, like a tour in a box at another site, um, and, and talking about your organization or speaking to, you know, the Rotary Club or the Kiwanis Club or whatever, I can see where that kind of leads into these opportunities. And you don't want to lose even a, a 10, 15, 20, $50 gift, right? Exactly. So you have to be careful and plan ahead, right? Yeah. That's really plan ahead. Get on the same page as an organization about what you're willing to accept, mm -hmm. vet these apps vet these forms of payment before you just try to, you know, adapt on the fly. If a donor says, Hey, I can pay you through this app. That's not something you're used to accepting. You don't want to be in a position to have an employer volunteer make that decision for your organization. Right. So do you recommend that you should do just, you know, like two or like the big ones, like say Venmo or Zelle or, or do you, what are your thoughts on this? Like, do you want to be like, we want to take them all so we don't lose anyone or do you want to narrow it down? What are your thoughts on that? That's a lot of a uh, lot of good things to decide. And I think as an organization, you have to think through a lot of different things to make that decision. Right. So some mm -hmm. not all of them are created equal. So you have to think mm -hmm. about also getting the information out. Right. The reporting mm -hmm. out is not all the same. So if you're using okay. this to capture your donor information, can you capture email addresses and contact information? Um, can you require a receipt so that you get that? Um, you know, okay. it's not just which, you know, which one for money in to make it easier. It's also what can you get out of it and what do you plan to use it for? Um, I'd recommend think of each of these cash apps like a bank account, right? So okay. on your internal team, every one of these needs to be reconciled and reviewed mm -hmm. and, you know, analyzed. And so the more of these you have out there, the more back office help you need to be able to reconcile and ensure that it's all being managed properly. So the more you use, the more resources you need to make sure it's managed properly. But yes. it's a fine line balance of if you don't accept enough variation, you may lose opportunities to collect money. So it's really right. a, a, a lot to factor in when making that decision. One thing before we move on, I've heard of organizations using, um, if you will, like a, a secondary almost like a savings account. So these funds don't go into their general checking account, but it's it's a an account that's an aside. It, it, it doesn't probably have as much activity. Um, and so it also insulates you from your main, you know, your, your main uh, accounting or not okay, checking or, you know, your main uh, your main account, I guess is the easiest way to say it. Do you have a thought on that? I think that's great because access is everything, right? So you may have multiple different people using these apps if they're off site. 
you, you know, you want to make sure they're using company devices, not their own personal devices, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't download their own personal or offer a personal app to collect money. Okay. Uh, but where that money comes and goes, absolutely. Because if you have multiple people using the apps, you want to control their access. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to think about is some of these apps also allow you to pay out from them, right? So you'll transfer the money wow. out to your bank account. But you also want to be careful with some of the apps. And again, I'm trying to be careful not to name any, but you're able to Ooh. pay through them as well. And I'd highly mm -hmm. recommend only use them to bring in money. All okay. your payments, have that go through your normal AP process, right? That has controls, purchasing requests, um, yeah. different people involved. And that's another way to just help reduce risk mm -hmm. with using these apps, right? Money coming in should only get transferred into, you know, the bank account where it's going to go. That should be limited from your 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 larger pot of funds. Okay. All help reduce risk. I love that you said that. And I think that's, um, that's just a general uh, piece of wisdom, right? <laughs> that can really help... Uh, help you protect yourself for some other things. Let's talk about this. You mentioned um, this briefly, and that is accessing donor information and how we get that donor's uh, vital information so that we can begin a relationship. We can thank them. Maybe we can, you know, put them into our donor, uh, our CRM or portfolio. Talk to us about this because everybody's so freaked out about the nature of giving up information. What are you seeing and how is this playing out? So it's really important to collect. If you're gonna have that donor relationship, you need their contact information. So some of these apps allow you to process a payment without collecting any of that great data. So we'd always encourage as well, if you're going to receive a gift of a decent amount, you want them to probably donate through a different means than this cash app to make sure you can follow up and make those, you know, connections and relationships at a later date. So there's a fine line of you don't want to say no right now. You want to have an alternative way for them to donate to you. Um, but there's there's probably no greater fear of a nonprofit besides running out of money than having their donor database, you know, hacked and having that information get out there. It's a reputational risk. Um, you know, donors are not going to want to go donate to you if they have concerns about your ability to safeguard their information. So it's really important to be focusing on how you can best protect your donors. Mm -hmm. And so some recommendations we would make typically would be, you know, have it on your website or make sure your donors are aware, what are the official channels of donating? If you're not an organization that's gonna do a blast text message, they shouldn't expect to get a text request for a donation. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not an organization that solicits through email, if they get an email, that should be a, you know, a red flag to them that this isn't a legitimate donation request. So you want to have information out there about how does your organization fundraise so that your donors feel comfortable that they're giving to a legitimate solicitation and they're not being defrauded. You know, I never thought about that. Um, I, I've seen that with just um, some of my own household bills where you'll see the, the vendor say, we will never call and ask for this information or we will never text you for this information or whatever. So yeah, I like that you said that. I think that's really interesting and and super, super smart. And again, I think the message here that you said so brilliantly is that, you know, it's this trust aspect of our donor safety and security. And if if that gets botched, oh my gosh, I mean, we have bigger problems, right? I mean that that could just cripple an organization. Um now, this is something that I hadn't really thought of, and I can't wait to learn about this. Credit card gifts and how scammers test stolen cards. What does that look like? So I've actually seen this in practice. And if you're not a fraudster, you may not think or even know that this happens, right? So who would think right. of it? So nonprofits are more susceptible to this. Um, what happens is a fraudster may steal a credit card or have a whole lot of them. And what they do is they want to make sure that they haven't yet been reported stolen and they're still available to use. And okay. so one of the things they may do is go on a nonprofit's website and test them all by giving small dollar donations to ensure that it's still a real card. And then they'll go use it elsewhere to you know, run up the charges and defraud the, the card holder. They pick nonprofit websites a lot of times because... 
Credit card companies often aren't going to flag donations to nonprofits or payments processed on a nonprofit's website as fraudulent or suspicious. So it buys them time. And a person may not recognize it as a fraudulent charge quickly either. They may think, maybe I did donate. Maybe it was only a couple of bucks. It's not something that may raise suspicion. All of this just buys them time. And often there's not a shipping address attached to it, right? You're not buying anything. And so some right. sites may allow you to just put in, you know, the name, the card number, and mm -hmm. you're on your way and you don't have to provide much other identifying information. So it's a real problem. And it's identified a lot of times through the credit card processor, or if you have a development person that's watching, you know, or getting notified, you'll often mm -hmm. see a flurry of activity with small dollar amount donations in a brief period of time. And that's a big sign that you met your website may have a problem. And it really can, can impact the nonprofit in a negative way without even trying to, you know, without them actively doing anything. Right. Right. What a fascinating thing, because yeah, I mean, if you, let's say you go to a department store that uh, a charge is you, you've never shopped, you know, I know those things will get flagged up, but I, I think this is just like crazy, wickedly smart to do this, the nonprofit thing, because yeah, it seems innocuous and um, and it it seems plausible, right? Like, oh, this customer just did a ten or twenty dollar gift. Exactly, and the, and the person may you know donate to a bunch of organizations and not think much yeah. of it. And so, um, you know, when the when the person who's been scammed realizes it, you know, the nonprofit can be on the hook for returning the gift, the transaction processing fees, right? And I'm talking sometimes these are thousands or tens of thousands transactions at a time. And so the nonprofit Ooh. may be on the hook for all those processing fees that get charged every time, every time a credit card is run on your website. There may be chargeback fees. And if you, you know, the, these examples happen. If you look in the news, you can see the fees and the, the costs involved for the nonprofit to rectify this can be horrible for a budget. Like nonprofits don't have the budget to fight this type of um, scam. Yeah. Well, just the bandwidth. I mean, you're trying to do you know, the work of the angels, and then you have to mess around with something like this. It's, it's heartbreaking. It really, it really, really is. Um, let's talk about this fraud. And, and this is just fascinating because again, this is one of those things that is really presents itself in this digital realm and maybe not anywhere else. Gift refunds. This donation was made an error. Please refund this. Yeah, and this, this. this is a real thing, too. And we do see it. I mean, it, it's happened with checks. See, there's a lot of stories in the news about checks and then they request a partial refund. But it happens a lot with digital and credit cards. Think about if you make a gift on a website and, it's, you know, same thing, stolen credit card. They make multiple gifts on your website and then call you up and say, technical error. My gift went through and you charge my credit card, you know, four times. Can you please refund me? I only meant to donate once. That seems pretty plausible, right? right. But someone makes that request. Um, and so what, what they're doing is they're using a stolen card to donate money to you. And then they're requesting a refund back partial or in whole. Sometimes it's a tech error. Sometimes it's, I meant to donate $10 and it charged me a hundred. And then they want you to refund you money in a different form than what the original gift was made. Right. So and so that to be mailed or, you know, right. refund me to a different card because that card's closed, you know, things like right. that. So that's really the alert is is that the refund is going to be processed <laughs> through a different path. And like you said, I, I, it's genius. Oh, the card's been compromised. And so the account's closed. Just charge it back to this other card. Any request for a refund of a donation should raise a red flag in your mind. It's It okay. should be rare, right? There's there's only a handful of reasons I could think of that would be legitimate for a refund request, right? So maybe you donate for a project and they cancel the project or they finish the project. Okay, mm -hmm. I want my money back instead of letting you use it for other reasons. Other than that, there's not a whole lot of legitimate reasons that donors should be requesting refunds to you. So mm -hmm. any refund request should, should have your guard up. You wanna make sure mm -hmm. you contact the person to identify, did you know, are you know, through a different form than what they contacted you, mm -hmm. and maybe you set a policy, a refund policy, 
you have to wait. I'm sorry, but you have to wait 30 days before we yeah, can yeah. refund you your money. That enough, it could be a deterrent from somebody. They may move on to another organization. They may call back a few times and get different people in, in your organization. So you want to make sure everyone's aware of the policy so that someone can't get around it. But you really should have parameters around refunding donations, mm -hmm. especially if it crosses tax years, too. They got to you know, in theory, they, if it's a legitimate donation, they got a tax credit and then want their money back. Refunds should always really have red flags, alarm bells ringing in your in your mind. Yeah. So fascinating. I think that it's, um, you know, you you mentioned in the green room that you like to call yourself, you know, the anti fraudster. You're not teaching people how to commit <laughs> fraud. You're teaching people how to avoid fraud and what to look for. And uh, I, I always think, you know, Jennifer, that there's this sense of um, insulation that who would commit fraud against a nonprofit? Because we're we're like the good guys and, and this isn't this shouldn't be going on. But I get this sense from you and your other leaders from YPTC over the years that this is really a, a much bigger problem than we let on or than we know. It's it is. And it's unfortunate because, as you said, it, it's um, a risk for nonprofits with their own employees. Right. It's usually small uh, organizations that don't have the resources to have those separated duties to prevent any one person from having their hand in too many pots. But it's also the external threat of fraud from third parties that could take advantage of a nonprofit that may not have the resources of a larger organization to help combat some of the, you know, the fraud risks, cyber, you know, technology, um, any of that. So it, it is a, it's very unfortunate. And I think there's a lot of good statistics from the ACFE about, you know, the percentage of revenue that nonprofits lose as a result of fraud. And it's really, you know, startling. So it's so important to, you know, I know we, as nonprofits, we all have small budgets, but we have to devote resources to protecting ourselves from scam internal and external. Right. You know, before we let you go, and we don't have much time, um, I would love to get your feedback. And this is a little controversial. Like, if we have been breached, if we have dealt with this, how do we communicate this out or fess up whatever words you want to use? Because I feel like there's shame, there's fear. Nonprofits don't want to report this because they don't want to appear to be you know, vulnerable or that they, you know, possibly engage their donors in something that's, you know, unseemly. What are your thoughts about this? How do we respond once this has occurred? That's very tricky. And as my accounting response would be consult legal advice, right? I can't right. tell you what to do, but it is a real thing with nonprofits don't want to report if a long-term mm -hmm. employee has stolen from them or if, they've been scammed or because they don't want their donors to know they want people to you know think of them as a respectable organization that can entrust you know they can entrust their money in so it is a real problem with making that choice um you know all i can say is reporting it or uh, can help prevent others from experiencing mm. the same problem and i think it's really an internal decision um, in conjunction with legal advisors about how to best handle it. I mean, sometimes you can't get your money back without prosecuting and, and going the legal route. So a lot of times it's a choice about the dollar value, you know, mm -hmm. and your reputation. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of choices to be made in that. So I don't know that it's a one perfect answer for every organization, but always consult, mm -hmm. you know, boards, legal, you know, to really get everyone's input on it. Right. You know, and I, I think... I, you said something really interesting and I don't know if I'd ever framed it up this way, but it, you know, the preventative nature and the protection of others in our sector is really a valiant reason to, to actually address this and, and own it. And um, I also think too, that sometimes when you have a problem or you have an error or you have a situation um, you can come forward to your community and say, this is what happened now moving forward we've instituted, like you, you mentioned a policy. Mm -hmm. And so we will have insulated ourselves from this happening again, or we've learned and, and we want others to know that this could happen to them um, because we're all in this together and, and seeing other nonprofits go through this uh, time and time again, is just shocking. 
it's, it's, it's just shocking. Absolutely. And there's times I think you're legally required to report if, you know, um, information is leaked or gets out there, but it is definitely, um, you know, something to really manage and control the communication Mm -hmm. around because like you just said, it, it can be helpful for others to see that you're taking action. A lot of times people who are committing fraud don't stop with once, right? So they may go get hired by another nonprofit. They may go scam, uh, you know, another nonprofit and it just, you know, hurts everyone. So, you know, taking that stand and being proactive in your community to say, I, you know, this happened, here's what we did about it. Here's how we're going to be safer going forward, but here's what we want to do to help everyone else from Mm -hmm. experiencing what we just experienced. And sometimes you may not even get scammed. It's the attempt, right? Some of those um, refund requests, not everyone falls for that, but to know that it's out there and help educate people about what's happening and what you're seeing can, you know, help keep everyone else accountable. Right. You know, I love that you said that. And that's a, that's a really interesting thing too. I think, especially putting it in the context of Q4, we're moving through this like big push, so many campaigns, holiday giving, year end giving, you know, we're trying to meet our our goals. And it's just like this really, really busy time. I can see where this is the time for things to kind of fall through the cracks, right? Absolutely. Higher volume, right? You want to get those gifts in, you want to be reaching out, but you know, you also want to be really thoughtful and careful about it. You want to protect your organization because that's the bigger long-term risk despite the short-term, you know, gain from some of these fundraisers. Mm -hmm. If you don't protect yourself and use caution and due diligence, you're not setting yourself up for, you know, long-term success. And that's why we say is the accounting team is probably the ones always saying, hang on, slow down. Let's think about this. Let's not react. Let's plan and be thoughtful about how we do everything as it relates to, you know, your finances. Yeah. I love it. I think that's a a wise approach to take, right? And I think that uh, we do get anxious and frustrated um, by changing the cadence of these things. Everything's a rush. Everything's an emergency. Mm -hmm. Everything has to happen now. But I think you're right. You know, just having that take a deep breath. This might take us a couple of days or we need to investigate this a little bit uh, further, I think is a healthy thing to do. I mean, just in terms of general operations, right? I mean, I think it's it's always a, it's hard, but I think ultimately it can be the, the smarter choice for managing things. Wow, this has been really good. I'm, I'm sad that we have to have these conversations, Jennifer, because it's just heartbreaking to think that you are working so hard as a nonprofit leader organization whether you're a volunteer, you're paid staff, and then to have to deal with these things is just gut wrenching because, you know, it it diverts your good work and your attention away to something that doesn't help your organization. Right. And so it's such a tough thing to talk about and such a tough thing to strategize. Um, But we've really been fortunate to have Jennifer Blasi here, manager, your part time controller coming to us from the Philadelphia area and really helping us to understand some of these nuanced um, fraud opportunities that come specifically with digital giving and how we look at this. So um, I've got to believe that this is changing every day and there are always new things, Jennifer, right? There are. And the, the best advice we can give is just make yourself a hard target. If things take a little longer, seem more complicated, most fraudsters are going to abandon you and move on to someone a lot easier. So make yourself not be an easy target. Love it. That Those are uh, wise words to end on today, my friend. Absolutely. Um, again, check out YPTC.com. They have the, an amazing trove of resources. You don't have to be one of their clients to um, access them. We have a lot of thought leadership that goes on throughout their organization talking about so many different aspects of uh, accounting and and financial management. So YPTC.com. Another thing we want to make sure that we express our gratitude to our sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, where Jennifer joins us from. 
Fundraisers Friday and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out, and uh, they really make a difference in our nonprofit sector. So we want to say thank you very much. Jennifer, you gave me a lot to think about today, my friend. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciated being here. It was, it was fun. <laughs> good, good. Well, we like hearing that. Hey, another thing that we like listening to and hearing and actually saying is every day, Jennifer, we end each episode with this mantra. And it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. Have a great rest of your week, everyone, and we'll see you back here for another episode.